I will, I will present you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to record this because sure. at this time of the year, you know, a lot of people are traveling and so on. They'll want to watch it later. Malik, can you start recording as well? And Luca, you can share your slides. Yes, I can. Let me. Okay. okay. Mali, is the, I see the streaming is on, but the, is the recording on too? Okay. I'm waiting for Mali to respond to me. Just one second, Luca. No problem. No problem. Oh. Uh, I can start it myself. Mm. Great. Okay. And Luca, share your slides. Oh, yeah. Just uh, let me go back to sharing mode. Okay. <clears throat> okay. This one. Okay, please confirm that you see what I see. Yeah, we can see your slides. Okay. Is that in a presentation mode, right? Yeah, it's perfect. Good. Okay. So, Azim, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us again in Monty Hart. It's a pleasure to have Professor Luca Testa, who is a good friend from Milano, talk to us about durability and long-term performance. Luca is, is truly an expert in all things interventional and is extremely well published. Um, with I'm not, I can't remember how many papers now that are first authored in very high impact journals, and we've collaborated on many of those. But I know one of the areas you've been very focused on recently, Luca, is durability and long-term performance. And I think this is an area for you know our faculty and our fellows to really understand because I think there's still a lot of confusion about what durability means and how we evaluate it and how we judge durability of TAVA versus surgical valves. Yeah. Yeah, I honestly, well, first of all, let me say thank you. Azim, it's always a big pleasure to contribute to this um, very important educational activities of yours. And um, you said you said all. I mean, obviously, this is a, a topic that is clearly very hot, especially because now we are all moving towards, uh, let's say, younger and lower risk patients. So durability and long term performance of this bioprosthesis are definitely important. So that it's not because of my interest in that, but it's interest of, of all of us. And um, you know, of course, it's going to be let's say, a brief overview, because there are multiple publications, as you know, and multiple data. But I tried as much as possible to summarize in order to deliver some, some key messages for our younger colleagues and fellows. So, of course, I will leave some minutes at the end just for, for discussion and questions. But um, for the sake of time, I'll just start. And uh, let me just... Uh, okay. All right. So... As you know, the introduction of TAVR has determined a paradigm shift in the treatment of degenerative severe aortic stenosis. A few years ago, this very first sentence was different because we have a lot of data, especially in the field of non-operable, high-risk or prohibitive risk. But nowadays, we are absolutely, or we have absolutely clear-cut evidence supporting the use of TAVR for low-risk patients. Problem is still in terms of age and thresholds, because you know, in the two sides and two shores of the Atlantic Oceans, we have a different opinions. Well, we'll get there during the discussion, I'm sure. TABR has been shown to be a safety and effective procedure with favorable early and midterm results. We will discuss that later on. Long-term durability and performance are paramount, as I just said, to support adoption TABR for a low-risk population. However, very few data exist describing bad function between five and 10 years, which is the key period for comparability with surgical aortic bioprosthesis. I'll try to clarify also the concept of durability in the surgical environment, the surgical experience. We get there at the end. So let's ask ourselves, what is the lifespan of transcatheter aortic bioprosthesis? Of course, this is just a list, and this slide is not supposed to be you know, read entirely, but it's just to show you what has been, you know, the focus of many publications so far. And actually, I tried getting this publication from, uh, well, this slide from Capodanno. As you can see, there are multiple, multiple studies. But honestly, the real problem is that they are all sharing different percentages, different, let's say, figures. And this is one of the main problems related to the fact, of course, 
as you can see in one of these publications of mine, the problem is actually related to the definition. So in other words, starting from the first experiences of structure bulb deterioration seen in bioprosthesis, there have been multiple different options, different approaches, different uh, classifications and definitions, including the definitions that I used in the publication that we did together as in, in 2020. As you can see, of course, every single publication has used a different way to classify the degeneration, the failure of the valve. And they actually, we summarized this in this publication of last year, but honestly, as soon as we started working on it, we soon realized that really there was a need for a standardized approach. And in a sense, we actually accepted the VARC-3 definitions as very welcome. But anyway, going back to the question. So these are the numbers coming from this, let's say the main publications available so far. And as you can see, regardless for a moment, regardless the definition, you can see that more or less the, all the percentages are in the range of three to 14, 15%, which is a very wide range. In other words, it's saying that according to different definitions and classifications, you may have different percentages, which is absolutely logical. However, we need to understand what we are talking about. And let's start from this analysis presented last year, 2022, at the Medical College of Cardiology by Professor Yardman. So as you can see, he pulled all the randomized control trial in a TABR versus the randomized control trial with SABR and to more than 2,500 patients coming from randomized control trials to evaluate the performance of the most famous self-expanding valves, as you know, the core valve. This is what we, we found in this publication he presented. So basically, the concept from this slide is that in terms of rate of SVD, TADBER was, let's say, more effective as compared to surgery or in other words, the problem of degeneration was more frequent in patients treated surgically. That's the very first big sentence coming from this presentation. However, if we look at the, let's say, breakdown of this data, according to the size of the annulus, we will see that basically there is some difference between large and small annually, as we all know, but then the advantage is probably more pronounced when the annulus is relatively small. And this is a problem of surgical approach, of course, not a problem of the self-expanding valve, the core valve evolute. Of course, we cannot apply this data to all the transcatheter aortic valves. There are several differences we will see in a minute. But in terms of type of degeneration, according to this presentation, to this pooled analysis, you see that moderate SVD is definitely more frequent than severe. And this is obviously related to the fact that severe SVD has always, well, almost always a clinical impact. With moderate SVD, sometimes the patient can be fine anyway. But what is the point? The point is that again, in this type of evaluation, different, different classifications and definitions have been applied. What about the predictors? Well, obviously, one of the main predictors is the body surface, which is, of course, in keeping with the size of the annulus, because these two things have a direct correlation. But you can also see some correlation between the age and the rate of SVD, the male sex, of course, but also the presence, for some reasons, of prior percutaneous coronary intervention and atrial fibrillation. So we all really don't know or honestly, what is the real link between these two things? But apparently, apparently, there might be some kind of protective or let's say ominous effect of these uh, elements. The notion trial is very well known. It, uh, the 10 years have been presented recently, but not yet published. So we can only talk about the eight year clinical outcomes. In this trial, they compare in a randomized fashion, TABR versus SABR, in a relatively small population, I have to say. And if you look at the eight year results, you can see that there is no difference, especially at eight years, but there's a lot of difference. And there's no difference in the old cause mortality, but also 
in the composite endpoint, including mortality, stroke, and myocardial infarction. If you look at the SVD rate, this is where the notion trial basically shown something that was really, really important. And I'm talking about the SVD percentage that was definitely, definitely in favor of Tabor. So in other words, the percentage of patients with all the characteristics listed on the left side are much higher, much prevalent in the Tabor group as compared to the Tabor group. This data has been published two years ago, so very important. But if you look also at the hemodynamics, well, you may have exactly the same, exactly the same information. So in terms of gradient, obviously there was, you know, a huge, huge change from baseline to the first year follow-up for both the tower air arm, but also the sour arm. But what is the point? The point is that the effective orifice area was way larger in the tower cohort but also the, the gradient was way lower in the tower core. So in other words, these two very important hemodynamics parameters were definitely in favor of the tower. Again, this, uh, let's say, other different element of the evaluation is the bioprosthetic valve failure was basically the same. But we need to consider also that in this kind of or clinical endpoint, clinical composite endpoint, you need also to consider that there is the valve-related death and the aortic valve reintervention that were definitely similar in these two arms. So in other words, the difference was somehow softened by the absence of the difference for these two clinical events. This is the publication that Azim we did together, and it was published in 2020, showing the long-term outcomes, long-term performance of TABR done by self-expanding valves. Again, I'm talking about the, the core valve. And as you can see in, this, in the right side of the slide, the percentage, but also the evaluation of the mean aortic gradient gave a very important message. There was a huge change from baseline to discharge, as obviously we can expect that, but there was no change over the following eight years after the procedure. So in other words, this data were basically exactly in keeping with the data coming from the notion. Difference is that this population was actually concerning more than 100 patients, so much larger cohort. And this is also oh, applicable for the paravarbral leak. In other words, the paravarbral leak was basically the same over the following eight years. What has changed, of course, is the number of patients at risk, because we need to remember that mortality is major issue for this patient, especially in evaluation or long-term results. What about the partner? Because we talk, we have been talking about the self-expanding valves so far. Now let's move to balloon. As you can see here, eh, of course, in the Sapient 3 S3 registry at five years, you see different numbers. But again, you can see that there is some kind of advan advantage for, for Sapien, for the valve, implanted transfemorally, especially as compared to SARO, as you can see in the right side. So more or less, again, in this in this trial, the uh, numbers that we have seen for self expanding are more or less, more or less consistent even in the field of balloon expanding. And this is also true for bioprosthetic valve failure, which is, as I said before, a more clinically oriented endpoint. So in other words, the data that we have so far are basically in favor of a very good durability without signal, without signal of reduced safety. The choice trial is probably uh, the last that we have seen so far comparing directly core valve versus Sabin XT. And the, the results are very well known, but just to mention, in a relatively small population, these two valves, these two platforms, have been compared in a randomized fashion. And as you can see, if you look at the left side of the slide, mean transprosthetic gradient from baseline to five years was actually in favor of the self-expanding valve. So in other words, the gradient measured after the core valve implantation was significantly lower compared to the gradient measured after balloon expandable 7XT implantation. And this is also true in terms of mean effective orifice area. 
So exactly as we've seen before, when you implant a self-expanding valve, apparently in five years, you may expect a larger orifice area and a smaller gradient. This is also true if you look at this, at this publication. And if you look at this, at this choice trial in terms of BVD, biobostatic valve dysfunction, you see there is a significant difference in favor of the self-expanding valve. So in other words, they found no events of moderate SVD or severe SVD in the cohort of self-expanding valve, but of course, some cases in the cohort of volume expandable. And from a statistical point of view, this difference was significant. Significant. This is, was not true for the event of vibrostatic valve failure, as I said before, because as, uh, com well, the components include some clinical endpoints, and definitely the, the implantation of a balloon expandable valve was not associated with a higher incidence of overall, overall death, vascular death, and cardiac death. But uh, we need to say this is this data are very well known, and I'm sure that you absolutely digested the partner three trials. So as you can see, there is no difference at five years between Tabor by means of balloon expandable valve, I'm talking about Edwards again, and Saber in terms of the composite endpoint of death from an echoes stroke and rehospitalization. But also there was no difference in terms of death for many causes, a stroke and hospitalization. But the problem here is that we need to distinguish these two things. At one year, Tabor, by means of balloon expandable valve, appear to be successful in terms of an advantage, a reduced, a reduced rate of the composite endpoint. This difference has been softened till disappearance after five years. So something has happened between the, the first year and the fifth year. And this is actually what happened. And we need to remember and consider. According to the part and three investigators, they found a much, much higher incidence of valve thrombosis in the tabor arm compared to the surgical arms. So in other words, as you can see about this red line, the other ratio is higher than 10 which means that the risk of valve, control, valve thrombosis is definitely much higher. Of course, did, this did not translate into an excess in terms of mortality. But we need to remember that this is one of the most important and significant message coming from the partner three trial. But the problem now is still, is still there because of course we have a lot of data showing how durable and how effective are the tablet platforms. And I'm talking about poor valve and Edwards only, because we don't have long-term data for our different platforms. So we cannot apply this data to other platforms. Let me, let me make this very clear. What we know so far concerns core valve, not even the last version, not even the Evolute, no, core valve and the Edwards Sapien. So in other words, old platforms, old platforms nowadays not yet, not still in use. But if you actually translated this sentence to the surgical biobrostesis, you see that the, the situation is not that different. In particular, because looking at this table in one of, public, in one of the publications that I did last year, the majority of the available, available surgical valves have no data exceeding the five to 10 year follow-up. And then we need also to remember that we are only talking about the actual freedom from SVD. Just let me make this clear. The actual freedom means that these percentages have been weighted against the competitive risk of death. So in other words, these are not absolute numbers according to the population at risk at different ages, but these numbers are weighted against the inherent risk of mortality. As I said at the beginning of this talk, the, the mortality risk is absolutely crucial to consider for the tablet population because they are very old. So the risk of death, in especially non-cardiac death, is definitely way higher than the risk of mortality related to the cardiac cause. So in other words, this literature is what we have so far. So not much, even for the surgical experience. So 
In other words, to make a comparison, and this is what we need, especially to expand the indication to Tabor to younger population, is the fact that we don't have long-term durability for Sabr as well, in most of the cases. Indeed, in these conclusions, I, I actually wanted to write this. Many of the bioprostheses currently implanted do not have studies reporting the actual freedom from SVD, but also it involves stentless valve, stented valve, pericardial valves, all of them. My, many of them have no actual rates to compare with TABR. In addition, most SABR studies appraise durability in terms of survival or freedom from surgical intervention, while others include hemodynamic parameters with heterogeneous definition again. So importantly, patients included in surgical studies are usually younger with less comorbidities compared to TABR studies. So these are my conclusions, and then I open to Azim for, for discussion. Assessing long-term durability and structural valve deterioration dysfunction has become an important issue for the choice of TABR versus SABR, particularly for younger patients. Longest follow-up, TABR showed to be safe. Standardized definitions are necessary, and definitely nowadays we have the VAR3, so we need to use it, not because they are the best, but because that's you know, probably the only way to standardize it. Do not forget that consistent Durability data for TAVR are expected no sooner than 2025. And I'm sure that this year, 2024, will be the, the year where we will see the notion of 10 year and I'm personally involved in this, the core valve clinical service evaluation at 12 years. They will come, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Luca. Uh, as usual, it was a great summary of, you know, the durability data. It's something that's frustrated me a lot. Yeah. You know, because when I, every time I, uh, uh, you know, we have, we have hard teams here. And every time I uh, search and go speak to a patient, they always say, oh, no, I'm going to give you a valve that's going to last 15 years. Okay. No. Um, and that data is based on the fact that there's maybe one or two studies showing freedom from reintervention at, at over 10 years, but not actual bioprosthetic valve de degeneration because a lot of those patients get degeneration and they're too high risk for redo surgery. So they don't get counted. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is actually, this is really the point. I mean, every time we discuss with a surgeon, the real, the very first problem is that we speak a different language. And when I say that, I mean, for us, we are actually, we are fond for statistics and data, long-term data. But as I said before, we are now in the phase of collecting data and producing evidence, especially with the actual freedom, which means that we see patients and we calculate the percentages with a true indication about SVD, BDF. They don't do that. They didn't do that. And as you mentioned, Many surgeons are, I mean, I'm not here to blame surgeons, but what I'm saying is the literature coming from the surgical experience is not as good as we are trying to produce nowadays. So if we compare, you know, apples and pears, of course, it's not going to work. But mm -hmm. there is still a misleading belief that a surgical bioprosthesis will last, as you said, more than 10 years. And we all know that it's not true especially especially when these bioprostheses are implanted in a relatively young patient, where the risk of early degeneration is much higher. Right. We, need to we need to find, let's say, a common language to speak with. But, but still, we are in the phase of collecting this data. But Azim, as you know, is frustrating because this belief is traditional, is conventional, and more and many of our colleagues are still inclined to believe that a surgical bioprosthesis will last longer, which is not true at all. And I've shown this publication, we don't have the data. So there's yeah. no need for us to, let's say, convince the surgeon. We need to, pro we need to produce the data and then they will convince. That's my hope at least. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I think that's important. I think also, you know, we harm ourselves a little bit. Um, so 
in interventional cardiology, we put ourselves to a very high standard in cardiology in general because we want large-scale data, we want proof, we want evidence, and that's what we base our decisions on. But I think also at times industry hurts us, okay, by not being fully transparent about the data. And, you know, you showed some of the Sapien XT data, right? The Sapien XT data at five years doesn't look great. <laughs> I well, mean, actually, about, you know, as well as the core valve data. I, I tried oh, I, I tried yeah. as much as possible to be balanced, Azim, but again, yeah. if you I mean being balanced means that I showed that I showed the table. But the table speaks itself, you know. I mean, when you see that this advantage that you have at one year is no longer there after five years, something has mm -hmm. happened. And you show me, not not me, they showed us a TCT, they showed that this curve tends to overlap and probably to cross even at a longer follow-up, we don't know, but don't they know. may cross in a, that longer follow-up. It's a problem. It's a problem because, of course, I mean, we all know that, you know, the Edward Sabin is a fantastic prosthesis, but for the short term. But for small annulus, for very small anatomy, at long term, I'm afraid we need to start thinking about what is going to happen when it will degenerate. And of course, we, this opens lifetime evaluation. We all know that. And, and I'm talking about coronary access. I'm talking about oh, patient prosthesis mismatch. And all, all these issues, of course, we cannot speak about that today. But the data that we have in terms of effective orifice area, gradients, and SVD or BVF, I must say they are in favor for self-expanding platforms. Of course, I'm, I feel that I should not say a specific name, but we all know that we are talking about core valve, okay. you know? So yeah. that, that these are the data, not my interpretation. Yeah. But the problem is now, you know, the, the argument is Sapien XT is not relevant anymore because it doesn't exist. Sapien 3 is now also not going to be relevant because, you know, we've started using Resilia here uh in a lot of my younger patients so yeah the we keep changing the benchmark you know what i mean so yeah. it will never it's gonna be a challenge too yeah to it's gonna be but I, let me let me say that i mean of course of course the new iterations will create a lot of discussion but the point is if we do not consider the long-term data that we have not much but what we have we will never have long-term data because as you know the companies and in the industry will always generate new iterations. So well, how can we set a standard yeah. if we change the standard every time? It's not going to happen. So I honestly believe that talking about core valve nowadays makes little sense. However, this is what we have. Mm -hmm. This is what we have. At the same time, a surgeon who speaks about Toronto MPV, yeah. what is that? I mean, it's yeah. no longer there since many years. However, it has been used and we need to search for data. We need to reduce data. So, of course, uh, methodologically speaking, it's not perfect talking about core, valve, or sapien. Yeah, of course. However, do you know any other way to? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. I see Andrea's on and Manaf's on. So let's see if they have a couple of questions. Please. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for this great talk. You really covered everything on durability. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment on the uh, what you just said. We, we published a study one year ago comparing the 10-year durability on balloon expandable, which is Sapien 3, basically, and uh, core valve, which was the majority of the other group. And we saw what you say, the superiority, particularly in the small annulae. So, uh, of course, we cannot cover everything. I just want to... <clears throat> ask you like a provocative question like we know that the core valve is uh, probably lasting longer based on the data that we have uh, but at the same time might impair uh, a potential towering tower so this is uh, important especially in a young patient with a small annulus so how can we find the right balance should we aim for the best hemodynamics and then consider the balloon expandable if the towering tower is not feasible or which is your algorithm well, what what I well, my personal algorithm that obviously is far away from being uh, evidence based is actually related to 
an evaluation of the prognosis and life expectancy. So we have, let's say, robust or relatively robust data showing that in the range of eight to 10 years, a core valve will probably function very well. But this is true provided that the implantation has been done properly. And this is a big question mark because of course, if you consider, for example, the presence of important paravalvular leak, if you consider the presence of possible asymmetric calcification where the valve is distorted, we don't know, we don't really know. What we definitely know is that if this core valve will be implanted in a very young patient, well, relatively healthy, by the way, with not a lot of comorbidities, it's going to be a problem because over the next 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, it may degenerate. So the anatomy, the expected life uh, life expectancy, but also, I would say, a consideration according to how familiar the operator is with the tower. We don't need to forget that, of course, we are in big centers, a lot of experience, we implant everything, whatever, yes. But if we tend to generalize this concept, I will never suggest to a, a friend or a colleague that is starting now to use that valve, especially that valve, even if it's not familiar with. Because we need to deliver the highest quality possible at the time of the first procedure. Obviously, we need to consider what is going to happen. But definitely, with the data that we have, we don't have long-term data with any other valve. So how can you consider, for example, to use a different platform for a low-risk patient with possibly 20 years of life, as a life expectancy? You can't do that. We do. We do all the day, every day. But on the other way around, I would say, if you use a balloon expandable, and this balloon expandable is in a relatively small anatomy, it will degenerate. It will. And then if you do a second tower, what is going to happen? You use a self, you use a balloon. You know that the European Association of Percutaneous Color Intervention has produced a couple of papers concerning the issue of tower in tower. But we need also to consider that it's really hard to standardize, Andrea. I mean, you can do whatever you want, but at some point there will be a moment where everything that you do will be at high risk of coronary occlusion, high risk of sinus sequestration, definitely creating a huge gradient. You may use basilica, you can use all these fancy tools. However, we don't have the perfect, perfect approach. So again, personal approach, anatomy, life expectancy. That's what we need to consider. And then familiarity with the platform. I know yeah. that that didn't answer to you, but that's the only thing <laughs> well, that I think is reasonable. It's not a simple answer, that's why. No, I mean. There's no, there's no, I mean, obviously no I, I do not pretend that I'm right. What I'm saying yeah. is I think it's reasonable, reasonable to look at the future, making sure that what you can get in the short term is the highest quality possible. Yes, yeah. and the best answer we can get now. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. Um, Manaf, do you have any comments? Thank you, Luca, for a great talk. I joined a little bit late, so I'm sorry if you've already uh, answered this. But one no question problem. I sometimes get in clinic when I'm seeing a patient and I'm talking about durability, and I tell them that when the valve degenerates, we can expect to repeat the procedure, especially in older patients, repeat the procedure and put another TAVR in. And their other question is often, do I expect this valve to last as long as the first one? And I'm not sure there's much data, but I wanted to hear what your answer to a question like that might be. And if you knew of any data that, sure. that looked at durability of valve and valve. Well, uh, you mean TAVR and TAVR? TAVR yeah. and TAVR, yes. TAVR and TAVR, yeah. Well, uh, I've actually, I published last year a paper that actually is called Transit. You may you may check on circulation intervention. We basically collected uh, cases coming from uh, more than 20 centers all around the world or tower in tower. So durability, I am sorry, Manaf, there's nothing, really nothing. What we know is one year, maybe two years follow up, but nothing longer than that. And um, this is obviously one of the hot topic for the future. Because 
now we are seeing the first wave of patients surviving and with a degenerated bioprosthesis, so transcatheter bioprosthesis. So I'm sure then in the next three, four, five years, we see many more, many more patients with this problem. Obviously, if we talk about, you know, what we can expect in terms of durability after Tabor in Tabor, honest, the honest uh, answer is that we don't know. But, but it's still a matter of concern in terms of anatomy. What we have found in the transit registry is that the larger, the better. I'm not saying anything new. I'm not saying anything groundbreaking, just logic. But I'm happy that at least the data confirmed what you can see, what you can anticipate, you know? The larger the anatomy, the, let's say, better the final result in terms of gradient, in terms of even paravalvular leak, even in terms of pacemaker implantation. So again, the problem is the small anatomy. And this is a problem for us. It's a problem for the surgeon because I don't know in, in New York and the US, but I can tell you that in Italy, no one, is doing the roof and the enlargement of the aortic root and large, not, no one, no one. So a small anatomy is a small anatomy forever. So even taber in taber, if it's big anatomy, well, let's say an annulus larger than 23, well, you got decent, decent expectations of a long lifespan of this prosthesis. If it's not, we don't have data to say. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, I think what you highlight, Luca, is, you know, we we have as many questions as we have answers uh, and a lot of work still to do to try and understand this better. And once we start adding Tava and Tava to it, I think the questions are going to become even larger uh, as to, you know, durability, which one's better inside as the second one. Um, there are a lot of answers um, or questions we will have, but uh, this is phenomenal, Luca. Uh, thank you so much for You're spending welcome. time with us and enjoy your Christmas and New Year. Oh, and yeah, enjoy your Christmas. Enjoy your Christmas and hope to see you soon. Maybe we'll see you at the CRT, maybe. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Unless you're coming in Italy before. I might be, I might be in Rome next, next month, so I might oh. see you then. Good, okay. good. Um, thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure. It's always a pleasure. Yep. Have a good day. Bye. Really appreciate your support. Thank you.